good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Urbat E University. I'm not sure if you heard me say it before, so I'm going to say it again. Happy Tuesday. Welcome back. This is week two, session three of the Urbat E University, and we're really happy to have you all on board. Um, my name is Sally Nishaw. Greetings from sunny London. It's been really nice to get the greetings in the chat from all of you from all over Europe and from some African cities too. Always good to have the weather forecast as well. So thanks, thanks for greeting. Keep on chatting, using the chat as a way to talk to each other digitally. So thanks for joining us today. Um, we have over 200 of you on board with the numbers rising quickly, as I can see from the counter. Um, I wanted to start this morning's session briefly, give you an overview of what we're going to do today, uh, and then we'll launch into the first plenary session of the morning. Um, uh, but before I do that, I also wanted to give an apology on behalf of all of us on the Urbact E University team, because we know that we had some tech issues last week, some problems, especially in the transition to the breakout groups uh, when we went from the plenary into the breakout groups in the middle of the morning. Um, we're really sorry for that because we know it caused some frustration that some of you might have found yourselves in the wrong breakout group or waiting too long in the waiting room to be allocated to your breakout group and that we lost a little time on the exercises which are actually really important working on the mirror board together to practice the exercises that we've heard about so we're sorry for that uh, urbax is uh, a program that always takes the ambitious route this is the first large-scale digital event we've ever done um, so we're learning as we go those were problems that we had hoped to avoid, but um, we think we have ironed out. We've been working over the weekend to iron them out and we're pretty confident we're going to have no problems today when we go into breakout groups. But what we'll do also when uh, we've finished, when Christoph has finished uh, his uh, presentation in the plenary session, we're going to be really clear with our instructions for you how to get to your breakout groups, how that's going to work and what to do if by any small chance there are any issues still today. So please bear with us and thank you for joining us again and thank you for sticking with both the, the, the plenary and the exercises which we think will really support you going forward with your integrated action plans. So can have an, uh, this is where we are today. Uh, you can see on the agenda of the whole e-university that we're going to have eight sessions which take us through the action planning cycle. And you can see the pin has moved to today's date, analyzing problems. So today we're going to have a presentation on understanding problems, how to do diagnosis of problems, giving you quite a lot of tips and exercises and inspirations, how to do that at local level. So we'll dive right into that in, in a second. And then um, Christoph will also give you a slight teaser for what's going to happen on Thursday this week when we start going into planning actions, building on that problem diagnosis and still thinking about the stakeholders that we've engaged from the session we had earlier this week. So that's where we are today on session two. Um, I just also wanted to remind you, thanks Christoph, about the Twitter challenge. Um, please don't forget that. We have a Twitter challenge. You can see the hashtag on screen, hashtag eUniversity2020. Um, and you can see an example, a great example, where one of the groups shared their um, mirror board so people can see how we're working on stakeholder analysis, working in breakouts digitally, and also using an interactive whiteboard. So feel free to tweet, to tell us what you're doing, to, to communicate uh, what the Airbag to E-University means to you and how the learning is going. So now I'm going to hand over to Christoph Gouache who is going to take us through a presentation on problem analysis with some great ideas and inspirations about how to do that in your own local group. Over to you, Christoph. Thank you, Sally, and um, hello, everyone. I'm very happy to um, have all of you here uh, today. Um, as Sally says, we're going to look at um, problem analysis and how important it is um, in a policy planning process. So we will look into um, actually uh, real tips and tricks on how to do that. How, of course, also we do it in a collaborative way, engaging as many stakeholders as possible in the process 
And that will, of course, link very much to what Mary has uh, presented uh, to you last week in engaging stakeholders. Same format, meaning that first part will be uh, plenary uh, with more inputs and principles, postures um, uh, regarding problem analysis. And then the second part, which will be more hands-on and where we will uh, all play um, uh, around one key tool for problem analysis. But we'll get that uh, to that later. So let's, uh, let's start with the, the first part, the plenary part, um, and our problem analysis um, uh, phase. So I would like to start with this um, quote that I like very much from um, Henry, Henry Louis Menken, uh, who's an American journalist. And he says, for every complex problem, there is an answer that is clear, simple, and wrong. This is a key sentence to understand problem analysis because too often we underestimate the complexity of the problems we try to tackle and we kind of rush and jump to uh, kind of easy solutions. But unfortunately, it's very rare that there is an easy solution to a complex problem, but rather a series of interconnected complementary sets of solutions. I know also that, and this is, you're all very familiar with this, especially at, um, at um, local authority level, um, that um, you've got the mayor from the Simpsons there uh, who says, no need to discuss the problem. I already know what we will do. I had an excellent idea this morning. We know there is a tendency, and um, it also includes elected officials, um, that we try to come up with a solution even before wondering or, or questioning the problem. Again, we really need not to do it the other way around. So to really um, uh, focus on the problem before even trying to think about finding an idea. So what's the problem with problem analysis? Well, the problem is often uh, the problem we're trying to solve isn't well framed and as to understood at the beginning. And then we will spend a lot of energy trying to develop solutions who will in the end end up failing at solving anything because it was not the right problem in the first place. So too often we believe we know the problem. In reality, we don't really. So first things, um, those are kind of key tips uh, or key reflex that um, you should uh, uh, kind of adopt whenever you're told about a problem, whether you're given a mission by your, you know, your hierarchy or whatever. Try to always have those warnings in mind. First one is the problem is most probably not, not the right one. The problem is surely more complicated than it seems. The problem is concerning way many people and way more than those we immediately think of. And again, that links to what Mary told you about the importance of going beyond the usual uh, suspects and usual stakeholders. So it's probably concerning way more people uh, than you initially think. The problem is going to be solved with, um, not going to be solved with a single and unique solution, as I said earlier, but rather a complementary set of smart solutions. And um, last one is that the problem won't be solved without posing new problems. And, that, and that's all right. That's all right. But let's be aware of them and let's be conscious of what those new problems that are emerging may cause. So those are kind of reflex that we should all have whenever being told about a problem. Always be very careful also with the, you know, those easy solutions um, to complex problems. You are all familiar uh, with colleagues, elected officials, even citizens who come to you and say, you know, it's easy. All you need to do is, ah, oh, simple. You do that and it's good or we just have to do this and we're, we're done. Usually it doesn't work like that. And um, when we're dealing with complex problem, I gave uh, just a random example at the bottom. Um, so random example, pro uh, complex problem, limit 
contain and or reduce illegal immigration? Simple response, easy, just build a wall. That type of answer is exactly uh, the type of answer that you should be suspect suspecting uh, because it's most likely not going to work, um, at least not as a standalone solution. So always be very careful and try to counter those, those two um, quick answers. It's also very important, um, again, when you do problem analysis to have empathy with the stakeholders, the users, the people you're going to engage with. In problem analysis, we're trying to understand the problem. We're not trying to judge or blame anyone in the process, okay? So you're all familiar with that type of picture, you know, all the people taking the shortcut uh, without the, uh, within the park. Here, what matters is not that we try to blame the people who are doing that, is rather to understand why they're doing that. And it actually probably makes a lot of sense that they take that shortcut and probably re should re-question the way we design the park. So again, here in that process, it's extremely important here to have a posture of um, empathy. So now let's see some concrete practices and attitudes when doing problem analysis on the ground, like uh, at city level. As I was saying earlier, uh, and Mary told you that too, um, it's most probably whatever the problem you were working on, there is probably quite a big ecosystem of actors behind it. Um, and one of the first thing you need to do whenever doing problem analysis is to map and identify all the stakeholders. Uh, not only because you're going to need to collaborate with them, but also because they, the more um, stakeholders you have identified, the more views, opinions, angles, and expertise you will have over your problem. So this is critical and one of the first steps uh, that you need, to, you need to do. Again, this collaborative mapping should not be done alone. It, should, it can be done with your EBAC local group. It can be done asking your colleagues, um, your elected officials, city partners, etc. cetera. Um, but, and, and it's a living, living object, meaning it's, not, it's never ended. Um, so it's a continuous process to map those stakeholders. It's also very important whenever you do problem analysis that you go out in the field. So go and check with reality, meet reality. What I mean behind that is that often in order to have a greater, more sensitive, qualitative understanding of the impact, for example, of your policy or the efficiency of your service, if you want to go beyond figures, if you want to go beyond only um, quantitative elements, you need to go to people's place. You need to meet them there. Why is it important? It's because this will also develop not only your empathy, but your understanding of a situation. The, the picture you see on the left are um, uh, people who benefited from um, um, energy subsidies. And no one ever visited um, how the, the, that policy actually impacted their daily life. And unless you actually go there, you can't understand the stories behind and the actual value of such a policy beyond uh, the, uh, the, the classic numbers. And so this will give you a great understanding. Again, we know you have limited resources, so we're not saying you should go and meet 500 people, but at least going and meeting five, 10 of them, is already a good sample of this, this sensitive um, um, uh, feedback that we want to get. It's also very important to develop this empathy in between stakeholders, in between uh, institutions that may have to collaborate with one another. Here, what, what you're seeing on the left is actual um, exchanges that we make in between professionals. So from one public service to another public service, we. Uh, sent one person to uh, observe for one day, one full day, um, someone else's um, institution as a way not only to develop a greater mutual understanding of the difficulties, the constraints, but also to realize what's the actual um, reality of, uh, of the people you may have to collaborate with. Not only develops empathy, but again, it really increases your, um, 
the quality of your of your understanding of the problems that uh, you may have in, in between um, your 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 uh, partners. So going beyond also what you've been uh, told or what you've heard, but seeing it by yourself, your own eyes and uh, experiencing it yourself. This is very important. It's also very important in a problem analysis that um, you kind of stick with this motto, which says nothing for us or about us without us. You cannot work on a policy, on a service, um, without working with the, the users, the beneficiaries, the people who are directly or indirectly affected by whatever decisions you may take in the process. So whenever you do your participatory, uh, uh, your diagnosis, think about how you can involve stakeholders, users. Here, what you see on the screen are frontline workers from um, a waste management facility. Um, and we worked with them directly um, and, and doing those map, uh, those mapping at, at the bottom that you see um, in order to really involve them because we believe that in the process they do hold an expertise that is really valuable. So don't only work with representatives of representatives of their directors, but also with the actual staff, um, technical staff and frontline workers uh, because they do hold a lot of expertise. And because in the end, what you may end up doing is really affecting uh, their job. It's also very important to, you know, realize that in whatever situation, whenever the problem is complex, the devil is in the detail. So it's not because you're going to, you know, um, uh, look at the problem from like uh, a large perspective that you will automatically identify where you need to act or what you need to do. Uh, you need to take time to uh, visualize the whole system and to dissect the process or and mount the engine if you if you're more into cars um, because this way you will you know put everything on the table and then can start identifying precisely what seems to be promising elements where you can act upon so it's also very important to visualize complexity visualize um, uh, problems this will help you uh, have not only a better understanding, but really clearly identifying where you can do something. In a way, problem analysis is a bit like putting yourself in a, a police investigator or a detective shoot. And I think that um, we can all take that, um, that metaphor of, of the detective uh, in, in policy investigation. Uh, and I will make some, some clear links uh, to illustrate what uh, it means to, to be in, in a police um, shoes. But we'll see that actually it makes a lot of sense if you consider all your policy urban challenges through the eyes of a detective. So first, um, uh, just one word about the pictures you're going to have on the screen here. The, one, the people you see on the screen um, are all civil servants. Uh, we played uh, and made um, a collaborative workshop in between a real um, criminal scene, uh, crime scene police investigator and us as designers, because we, we believe the practice in some cases is uh, somehow related. And you'll see that in the postures, in the reflex, uh, again, it makes a lot of sense. So first, it's never as simple as it seems. It's often the case also on a crime scene. We need to pay attention to details. That means that you need to go snoop around in places no one is looking at. And that some, sometimes even that, that no one is showing you, which means that you need to push doors. You need to kind of force your entry in, in some, some parts. Uh, like that lady is, is looking for, you know, an evidence or something uh, behind that, that, that couch. As you go in the process, exactly like a detective, you need to elaborate some hypothesis. Uh, you're already coming up with multiple scenarios on what happened, what was the situation, 
but don't stick to a single explanation yet because you don't have gathered enough proofs, evidence, and details um, to, to be, you know, um, judging on, on one single explanation, but build several hypotheses. So it's very important that during your investigation, you refrain from prejudging the situation. If you do so, then you're, you're, you're building a big bias because everything you will look for will be only to support your, um, your own intuition. So you may follow your intuition, that's all right, but look for facts, data, evidence. It's again come, going from you know, the feeling of a problem to an actual problem, to a real problem that has been identified, that uh, we, uh, we, we, we know about, and so on. So of course, uh, police investigation and policy investigation is not exactly the same. There are some, some elements that make sense um, and that we can see in, in both practice. But in policies, of course, in your cities, um, on the policy you're working on, there are rarely one crime scene, if we may call it like that, but rather a single, uh, a series of, of places, uh, a system of actors, etc. There is no criminal to be found, I mean, usually, in, in policy, uh, policy investigation. So we will look more into systems, norms, policies, habits, rules, socioeconomic factors, uh, et cetera, but a series uh, uh, and a multitude of causes. Uh, but we're not looking for anyone particularly guilty in the process. And then finally, <clears throat> a policy investigation is something organic. So you don't ever really put an end to an investigation, even though the process of diagnosis may kind of close one chapter in the policy planning process. Um, you need to remain open to future upcoming elements. So you don't kind of close the case like the police would do uh, in a police investigation. There is one tool also that we find very inspiring uh, for uh, urban policies investigation. It's the Crime Investigation Board. You all know those images taken from uh, TV, TV series uh, where you know, the police uh, detective and its colleagues all kind of sit back, sit back look at uh, their, their crime board or the links they've built and then start you know, reflecting about what happened and all the, the relations, etc. Actually, this is a very good tool that you can yourself replicate for policy urban challenge. I will show you just one or two examples, uh, one example that um, ourselves we're, we're, uh, are using. This is one of our uh, board that was uh, put in a project room. Uh, and inside you can put whatever you have from your investigation. So as you can see, you've got uh, pictures taken on uh, field observations. At the bottom there, uh, here uh, you've got some uh, key verbatims or key quotes from people we interviewed or stakeholders we met with. Um, so you can put pretty much anything you want on that board, which for you, according to you, are key in understanding of the, the, your problem. And you can also even identify, as you see right in the middle, some path for innovation. So, so some elements where you have an intuition that later on, there is probably something to be done on that aspect or on that point. So again, this is one tool from the police practice, uh, which may be quite interesting to, um, to um, kind of copy and adapt to your own practice. Of course, there are many, many tools to do problem analysis. So I will not go through all of them. What is very important is that you understand that whenever you're doing problem analysis, you need to mix the tools and adapt the tools to, to make your own. Um, you need to have some sort of field visits, guided tours, immersion sessions, uh, field trips, so checking with the reality that is key. Uh, of course, you need to get in contact, have people speak, through either face-to-face -face interviews, group interviews, 
open conversations, a coffee with whatever um, format, but you need to get um, those stakeholders speak out. Um, you can do surveys if you want more quantitative um, feedback. Of course, that includes also doing the benchmarking, the literature review, uh, but also you know, field observation, system mapping, system modeling, uh, problem framing, evidence analysis. I mean, plenty of tools allow you to get a greater understanding of your problem. The key thing is that there is not one magical tool that you can use, but rather you should shop within all the tools that exist and say, okay, according to our available resources, uh, to our time constraints, to our competences, which one seem the more promising to achieve a greater understanding of our problem. So that is um, the part that you need to uh, kind of filter the tools. Still, uh, I want to show you some more examples of practice that we use, that you can use, uh, but that sometimes also the police itself uses. Um, so as I said earlier, going on site, on field trips, visit places, enter in every room and spend time observing, spend time also uh, with people, as you see on, on the picture at the bottom there, spending also informal moments because key things may be said uh, during that, that, that type of moments where everyone's kind of relaxed and um, informal and, and convivial. Um, we need to really kind of, you know, get a sensitive experience of what it's like to be working, for example, on that place. Uh, it's not just by, you know, doing a phone call of 10 minutes that you will get a, um, a good understanding of what, what, what it is like. Like the police does, you need to call for witness. You need, you need witness, you need testimonials, you need to gather stories. And especially from those who are not often heard. So you need to give voice to a diverse crowd, which is why also what Mary told you about engaging stakeholders is critical because you need as many voices as you can, and especially non-usual voices. I mean, you are already familiar working with um, key local associations, NGOs, unions, representatives of representatives, etc. Here we're really talking about kind of first-hand testimonials and stories. The people you see on the screen here are um, juvenile educators from the Ministry of Justice in France in the Guadeloupe, in Guadeloupe, in the Caribbean Sea, where we worked. And we asked all these professionals to tell us stories about their professional uh, work that they do with their juvenile delinquents. And we wanted them to be very honest on the stories they would tell us. And they all had the choice to tell us either a success story or a failure. It happens that all of them, 100% of them, decided to share failure. None of them shared success stories. So they all shared failures, um, either personal professional failures or, or system failures or hierarchy problems, uh, but they really, like, really shared big uh, and hot stuff. And you need that. You need that. Um, those elements because they are critical for your understanding of the issue. Again, if you do so, you need to set up a friendly environment and safe place for them to speak out, which means that in, that, in those pictures that you see, there was no director, no elected official, no hierarchy of any sort, only educators all at the same level so that they could speak freely without having the risk of you know, being afraid that this would kind of um, go out of control if uh, anyone would um, hear them. So calling for witness, also one very fun thing to do, and you can all do it uh, on your own policy um, challenge, is to do a crime scene reconstruction or crime reenactment. Again, in your case, you don't have a crime. All right, but you can replicate or reenact a user journey, uh, a beneficiary getting into a service, or uh, a citizen getting um, um, 
you know, benefiting uh, from from your your um, policy or your um, your service, right? So it's very important that um, here the whole point of crime reenactment or scene reconstruction is that you do by yourself um, the whole journey of a user within your policy challenge. What you see on the pictures here is also in Guadeloupe. We wanted to understand what was the um, entry journey in jail for young people uh, like. So what it is, uh, what, what, what's happening in the first hours of your arrival as a juvenile delinquent in jail. So of course we did not ask um, a youth in jail to replay and re-experience its, its own entry in jail. So I was the, the juvenile delinquent and went on the journey. Why do we do that? Exactly like the police does, well, we're doing that because we believe that not only we will get a, a greater understanding of what happened, but also because we might find some small elements which might be worth looking at and eventually working on in the future. Uh, just for the little story, what you've got in the middle uh, was the trash bag. Uh, this is what I have been given as my welcome package to enter uh, before entering my cell. So every, we, we were told in advance by the, the director of the jail that every youth who enters or every other prisoner gets a welcome kind of welcome kit, welcome package. What we were never told is that it took the form of a trash bag. And I don't want to enter in the debate, but again, if we did not ask for the whole scene reenactment, this is a small detail where that we would have never seen and, and that we could have not worked on, especially in terms of symbolics and um, the, the feeling of being kind of hosted and welcomed uh, on the first day of uh, arrival for, for teenage boys of 14, 15, 16 years old. Anyway, so crime reenactment is very fun to do and, and very useful, whatever the topic you're working on. It's also very important that you kind of realize that when you do a problem analysis, you, you can be very neutral, but you can also be not so neutral. What I mean is when you look at police um, detectives or police investigators, often they're provocative. You know, when they are asking questions, either they do ask fake, naive questions just to provoke, or they directly uh, kind of gently attack the, the, the people they interview with some hypotheses or scenarios they've built. Again, this is really useful. You can meet, interview neighbors or stakeholders like the police does, but don't hesitate to submit your hypothesis to collect their points of view, but to provoke their reaction and compare the results. So if you already have some hypotheses, write them down, uh, whether it's on the form of, of some cards like you see on the screen. So each card is one hypothesis and, and provoke the conversation because you want people to kind of react spontaneously and naturally. You don't want the stakeholders to just tell you what you want um, to hear, okay? You want a, a real, a true response. So don't hesitate to provoke them a little bit. And then finally, um, you may also draw and visualize systems when they are complex. There are links, relations, um, in many and most of your policy challenges, uh, you are all tackling complex problems. But, and often, unless they are concerning infrastructure or equipment, uh, often they're, um, they're also quite abstract. Uh, here, what you're seeing on the screen is the system map of the um, uh, European regional funds. And clearly it's a mess. We did not understand anything about it. And we needed to actually draw and visualize what it was like what, how it was organized, because 
otherwise there is no way you get an understanding of such an abstract level uh, of complexity. So again, mapping and visualizing are also key tools uh, for you to um, understand better your problem and the system in which you're navigating. As you see on all the pictures, we're never alone, which means that th that type of exercise can on on not only be done with your um, stakeholders, but also at your uh, back local group level, right? And don't tell me, well, it seems too complicated to do. We don't have the tools. We don't have the resources. Look at that picture. What you will see is coffee cups upside down, right? Coffee cups and a bit of paper cuts. So you don't need particular materials to do system map. You can take a whiteboard. You can take um, a picnic table sheet. You can do whatever you want. Um, it's not so complex. Uh, improvise. Feel free to be creative in the way uh, and the materials you, you will use to do uh, your visualization. But visualizing is the first step to better understanding. It's extremely important um, that you invest in problem analysis. Again, because as I was saying earlier, if you don't, if you get the problem wrong, all your efforts for finding the right solutions will be in vain because you will end up trying to solve a problem which is not the right one. And this is not only time consuming, but also money waste um, and energy waste. Uh, so let's be careful with this. Um, and it's often the case. So now uh, I would like us to stretch a bit uh, because we are going to do um, the part two of uh, our session, which will uh, look at an actual uh, tool that we suggest you uh, to use. So don't hesitate to stretch a little bit, move your neck, your shoulders. Uh, I won't do the, the, the Mr. Bean dance because it's way too, um, too strong and too good for me, but um, please move a little bit, uh, relax uh, for a bit as we're now diving into part two, uh, which will be the group workshop. Um, we will look at one key tool again. I told you there are many tools to do problem analysis, okay? Uh, many practices, many methods, uh, I tried to show you as many as possible uh, in such a short time. Uh, feel free to, to kind of adapt them. Um, and, and now we will look at one key simple tool that you can undoubtedly easily replicate with your airbag local group. This tool is called the problem tree. Uh, the problem tree is very simple. Um, it can be used even just alone. Uh, by yourself to pre-identify some potential causes, but of course it makes greater sense when it's used collaboratively and especially with your uh, backed local groups. Simple exercise to replicate for you, yet a very good ex uh, tool to have a collective understanding of the issue. Um, again, this tool should not be used as the only investigation method but as one of the complementary technique that you need to do to pre-identify your problem. So what's the problem tree like? The problem tree like, um, so you have on the left of the screen here, your problem tree. The structure is very simple. The trunk part is the problem. It's the main hard problem, okay? And you will see that you'll be sent to uh, my robots and uh, you will have more explanations also on what will be uh, the problems where you, you are uh, play, playing with. So main trunk, problem. The roots are the causes of the main problem. And again, we'll see that they might be very diverse, they might be multiple and probably quite numerous. And at the top of the, of the tree are all the effects. So the branches and leaves, and there aren't leaves here, but all those branches are all the effects of your main problem. 
keep in mind that you will have to look in the exercise both at causes and effects. Keep in mind that um, most often a problem has a very complex set of um, causes at, at its root. Okay, it's not one cause; it's multi-causal, and the causes are very diverse and of very different nature. Causes may be internal, external within your institution, contextual, systemic, cultural, economical, uh, you know, policy related, even psychology uh, uh, related. They can be many things and some on which you may have control, some on which you may have no control at all, but we don't care for the moment. We need to list as many resources we can find, okay? So you will be starting with the causes first. After identifying uh, and choosing your main problem, you'll see you've got um, five problems to choose from. Uh, once you've agreed as a group on which uh, problem you want to work on, you'll pin it on the main trunk, as you see on the left picture here, and you will start identifying causes. As you see on, on the left picture, um, the causes are kind of, you know, following the roots and kind of in line. Uh, this means that every root is one cause, okay? Every root is one cause. And the ones that are like following uh, on the same root are the causes of the causes. What I mean is once you find one cause, try to at least two or three times find the cause of that cause. So if you, you will see that you'll have an example on your Myra board, don't hesitate to have a look at it. Um, and why we're doing that is because sometimes we will have later on in the process to uh, decide whether we're working on sub causes or indirect causes rather than the main cause, because for some reason, th those are more accessible or achievable, reachable, and, or just easy to work with um, and more impactful. So that's why you also need to go a bit beyond um, uh, the initial causes you found. Try to start by listing the most obvious ones. Okay, all the obvious reasons, just put them there. And then you need to try to find extra ones until you can't think of any other. Try to even think of some that may be very far from the initial problem or just, you know, a small cause of it. That's fine because what we're looking for here is exhaustivity. We're not looking for making it short. We're making it complete. Quite similarly, um, at the top of the tree, as I was telling you earlier, are the effects, okay? Effects may be collateral, side effects, and again, effects generate effects. So you might have also to look for two or three ricochet effects. Um, and those come from, uh, are generated by your main problem. Again, try to list very diverse ones. We're looking at all the effects, but whether it's economical, social, cultural, whatever, we are looking for a diverse set of effects because again, often we're missing key effects that um, we don't realize they're, they're actually coming also from that key problem. And then we, we just forget to uh, tackle them. All right, so um, now I will, um, in a minute, hand back to uh, Sally. Uh, but you, you will now work as a, as a team, uh, like you're now uh, getting familiar. Uh, you'll be split into subgroups, invited to go to your Myra board. Um, so on your Myra board, each group will have an empty tree to be filled in. Uh, with plenty, as you, as you see on the, uh, on the screen here, plenty of already um, prepared uh, post-its that you can just drag and drop on the roots 
and on the effects at the top, the branches. Um, and you will have to um, build your own tree, discuss uh, the causes, discuss the effects, even though for the moment, the most important is really to try to list as many as you can, and then you will have more time to kind of discuss them, uh, and especially the ones that are, um, you know, the causes of the causes that you, you, you can do uh, as a team. All right, so I tried to be on time to stick to um, our um, tight schedule. I hand back to you now, uh, Sally. Christoph, thank you so much. That was a fantastic presentation. Uh, bang on time and lots of really interesting ideas in there. You haven't been able to see the chat. The chat's been busy. So, uh, and some really interesting comments that people are bringing in. I'll just mention a couple of them, then I'm going to give instructions for us to be able to move out of uh, plenary at, at, uh, at 10.50 in three minutes. Just in the chat, Christoph, so you know, some really good reflections that also for everybody, I think these are really interesting topics for us to pick up maybe in the, in the breakout groups too. The mayor was very well recognized <laughs> and there was a whole issue around how we encourage uh, elected representatives to not jump to solutions who need to prove they're doing something. How to involve mayors in problem analysis. Any good examples of that? Uh, secondly, that this is very time intensive and that links to the political imperative to do something. So how do we persuade local authorities that this is a, a worth the time investment to do these processes that um, we shouldn't just be jumping to solutions, not, not something in the culture maybe of municipalities to do that. Um, a, a whole thread about how we do these tools in COVID. Uh, a lot of the, the examples you've talked about, we'll maybe have to wait until we can do things together again physically, but what are the hybrid models where we can take some of these tools and how do we make sure that some of the really important stakeholders, especially the, the first person testimonials, don't get lost uh, in times of COVID, which could exacerbate inequalities. And the last one I want to just pick up on is a bit about um, models that don't center problems. So the problem doesn't have to be the center of your, your method. We're, and we're choosing to show you this method here because it's useful, but it's not the only way of doing things. And we completely agree. There are other models out there that would maybe take a different approach. This is just one way of doing it, which is really useful. And I think Liat will pick up a bit on that in the next session about taking this into vision, uh, which is maybe a different way. So brilliant session, brilliant questions. Now it's time to think about going into our breakout rooms. So listen up everybody, this is gonna work, here we go. Uh, the way this is going to work is similar to last week and same procedure. So what you will need to do in a moment, when I say go, is to find the personal link that you were sent uh, by email. You've been sent it previously, you were sent a reminder last night, it's called your personal link, not to share with anybody. You take that link, click on it, and again, you will find yourself in one of the three waiting rooms, A, B, or C. So we want to, as soon as I finish talking and say go, we want you to follow that link and go into one of these waiting rooms, A, B, or C. Once you get into the waiting room, you'll be greeted. There'll be people there to make sure you're in the right place. And you'll be there in a holding spot until 11 o'clock. So sit, once you're in there, get your coffee, relax. You're in the right place. At 11 o'clock on the dot, we're going to hit a button and you will be automatically go out to your correct breakout group. So once you're in the waiting room, sit tight, make sure you're in the right one, A, B, or C. Uh, talk to people there, get a coffee. At 11 o'clock, we're gonna hit the button and you'll go automatically to the right breakout group. That's gonna work, pretty sure. But if it doesn't, if you find yourself, number one, alone in your waiting, if you get into your breakout group and there's not many people there, just wait. You will, you will, as long as you're in the right group and your e-facilitator will welcome you, wait for the others to join. Don't, don't think, oh, I'm going to go back to the waiting room or I'm going to go down the corridor, the e-corridor. Sit tight in your breakout group and wait for the others. If you find yourself still in the waiting room, which is what happened last week, unlikely, just sit tight there and we're going to be doing really quick allocation to the groups. We've got a team who are going to be allocating you quickly to your right breakout group. Um, and if for any reason you get completely lost, then you email, the e respond to the email that you had yesterday. Unlikely, but um, find your e-facilitator, ask for help, and we'll make sure you get rerouted by the tech team to the right place. The workshop starts at 11, finishes at 11.45.
When it finishes, we'll come back into plenary and Christophe will do a wrap up for us. To get back into plenary, there are two ways. The best way is to click on the back to plenary button on your mirror board. That worked for most people last time. So your facilitator will have a countdown and help you all get back into plenary by clicking on the back to plenary button. If that doesn't happen, you can go, you'll automatically be sent back into a waiting room and you'll come back in that way. So there should, there's two routes, let's go. The best route is to click on the button in the mirror board. Otherwise we'll make sure you get back into plenary and then we'll wrap up for the last 15 minutes until midday. So I hope that's all clear. Um, and my, I invite, thanks again to Christoph, completely brilliant presentation, thank you. And now I'm gonna invite you to click on your personal link and go off to your waiting rooms, enjoy the exercise and working with your groups on the mirror board. Off we go. So as people come back, I hope, um... The problem tree exercise was quite um, um, understandable and easy to use and um, hopefully uh, you will also be, uh, be quite um, you know, uh, comfortable using it and replicating such an exercise, for example, with your airbag local groups. It's quite something you know, reachable, it doesn't request too much uh, resources or materials as you see, it can both be done either um, physically, like on paper uh, or flip chart or whatever, um, during a physical meeting, but also uh, online using uh, a tool such as uh, Miro. Okay, I think the numbers are getting slightly stabilized. So I suggest that um, we uh, keep going uh, with the, the a little recap of um, our uh, problem analysis session. So to uh, recap on, uh, on this session, it's important, uh, again, that we know well the problem in order uh, to define whether we can do something to tackle it. Um, keep in mind that the whole process of problem analysis is really also a strategic choice regarding opportunities, chances of success, uh, but also uh, the available resources, capacities that you have, okay? So the problem analysis is there to really help you make decisions on whether to act or not, and on what to act upon, uh, which is why it's not, you know, something just nice to have. It's kind of a compulsory um, step within a process. It may be also very important at I mean, throughout a problem analysis that you question yourself as a local authority or a stakeholder to do a bit of a legitimacy test. Does, in the end, this problem fall within our competence? How and why? Meaning, is it really our problem to solve? Uh, are other actors involved in this field and topic? Meaning, is there other stakeholders who are actually maybe even more relevant to tackle this issue than I am as a city authority? And then in the end, even knowing that, is there a good chance that I actually do have um, a good chance of bringing added value to solving the problem? So this is what we could call the legitimacy test. The second element, is what we could call the sensitivity test. So do we really have a chance to make a difference or not? Because if not, maybe we should not even work on, 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 on that problem in the first place. What's the weight of external factors? You worked in, on the problem tree identify, and, um, identifying plenty of causes at Brooks level. Many of these causes, you can't do much about them. Um, there are external factors on which you have no reach at all. So if 99% of the, the causes, you can't do anything about it, then maybe that means there is, it's very unlikely that you do solve the problem. Um, it's also very important to question whether the problem is well known and stabilized or, or whether it's something completely new, completely random and disruptive. And, and unidentified yet. Uh, therefore, you might have to wait a bit to, be, to, to try to know a bit better about the problem. 
And then you should ask yourself on the question, what would have happened if we don't do anything about the problem? How bad is it going to be? All those, problem, all those questions are all meant to help you make choices. Um, this is the simplified version of um, the journey of analyzing problems. Uh, you need to adapt the problem uh, to listen, meet, collect, observe. So all this um, reality check and field trips, etc. Then, of course, you need to analyze, compare, cross-check your data. It's not because you've done qualitative interviews that you, you're taking for granted everything you've, uh, you've been told. You need to cross-check all that to see if there is consistency in the uh, analysis. Then it's also very important to share and enlarge the conversation. So share your diagnosis at early stage so that you can enlarge the conversation with stakeholders. Um, and of course, in the end, make choices, evaluate the opportunities and the resources, and that will lead us later on to also next steps, which would be to create a vision and generate ideas, etc. So at the end, more or less, of an analyzing problem process, there are kind of three options. Simplified version. Option one is you may decide not to act. And that is all right. That is fine to be um, you know, a local public authority and to decide after a problem analysis to say, regarding the situation, the factors, etc. We don't believe that we can do much about it, that we will have influence, that we are legitimate enough to be acting on, on this issue. It is not for, for us to tackle. That is, that is all right, and that is uh, understandable um, as well. Option two, and it's most often the one that um, we tend to go towards, is to decide at the end of a problem analysis to just kind of redefine, rephrase, or re recalibrate the perimeter of the problem. So you do have your initial problem, but the next version of your problem will be slightly reshaped. And that's often what happened after a problem analysis session. The last um, option is also that you do decide to work on the problem, but in a completely indirect way within the system of your problem. So you will decide potentially to actually not go frontally to the initial problem, but to tackle sub or collateral problems which do have a key influence in your system, but respond to it indirectly. And that is also okay to decide to work on indirect rebounds uh, and ricochet uh, problems. So all that, uh, once you know what problem or problems you wish uh, to work on, then will come the time for you to also build with your stakeholder a bit of a desirable vision of that future without that problem. So that future, what the future would look like in a world where those problems are solved at city level or, or um, larger level, uh, what would the future look like if I have solved uh, my uh, empty shops in the city center, if I have um, solved the, the problems you tackled in the problem chain? And do we collectively kind of have the same shared vision about it or not? And, and then, We'll see later on, and you will see um, with Leah later on, and I, I will, of, of course, uh, give the floor to her um, in a minute or two. Uh, you will see that we're going from this problem analysis, which is really putting the, the first basis of your work. And this will uh, be um, leading the way for all the steps um, forward. Um, just to, before passing the, the floor to uh, Liat, uh, do we have, I think we do have maybe one or two minutes uh, with you, Sally, if you want to bring, it, uh, to bring up one or two questions.
that we didn't have the time to uh, respond to from the, the pre previous um, part one. Thanks, Christoph. In fact, I think what we'll do is take some of the questions that we had in the chat onto Basecamp. Um, there's a suggestion we can actually, on the Action Planning Network Basecamp, we can continue those conversations around especially different tools that don't center a problem, but also um, how we adapt these tools to a COVID situation. This is yeah. not going to go away. We're going to have to work this way for the next 12 months, probably six to 12 months. And you and your ULGs, first time ever for Urbat, we have you working digitally in ULGs. So some help for you to, to, to sort of translate what we've done today into digital format. So I think that's, that's all from me. I'm going to pass back to Christoph, apart from just saying, I'm really pleased. I think we had technical, uh, less technical problem today. I think it worked really well. So thank you so much for bearing with us and getting into the groups quickly coming back. Certainly in my group, the tool worked really well. So I hope you can all use that. That tool is in the Urbac toolbox. So please go and have a look in the Urbac toolbox and check out the e-university website where you'll get the recording that, of Christoph's presentation. You can use that with your local group too. But back to Christoph and the app for the handover. So thank you. Thank you, Sally. Uh, indeed, uh, moving to uh, online tools is, is critical for the moment. Um, be creative with those. Uh, for example, the crime board uh, investigation um, that I showed you earlier is easily replicable on uh, a tool like MyRoboard since you can bring in pictures, bring in verba teams and quotes and so ever. So be creative also in trying to transfer some of those practices onto digital tools. I will now um, pass the floor to our next e-manager, uh, Liat Rogel, for the next session on Thursday. Liat, it's yours. Thank you, Christoph. So, hi everyone. I will not uh, take long time from you. I will do this next week. Uh, so, I look forward to actually discuss with you uh, some of the issues that came about also in the chat. So how not to focus then only on the problem, how to move towards a vision, uh, how to discover the small dreams that hide uh, behind our problems. So we will, we will talk about having a vision, having a shared vision and having a positive vision and how to do that with tools and of course with an exercise. So I really look forward to it. And I wish you a great day, and I see you all on Thursday. Bye, everyone. Bye. See you Thursday. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. See you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.